Our first speaker, uh, Jeff Bean. Jeffrey joined Silman in 2005 and was promoted to associate and studio leader in 2015. His experience at Silman has encompassed a range of projects, uh, including adaptive reuse, new construction, preservation, and building and material forensics. Collectively, he has over 20 years of experience in the construction industry, having worked as a carpenter prior to earning his engineering degrees. Jeffrey has a BS in architectural engineering and an MS in structural engineering from the Milwaukee School of Engineering. A few notable recently completed projects include the renovation of Baker Hall at Yale University, the REACH, an expansion of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., the Admiral's Road development at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and the preservation and upgrades of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Please welcome Jeffrey Bean. Thank you, Tom. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's an honor to be here today and present along such talented architects, uh, engineers, and builders. Uh, I would also like to thank the Kennedy Center for their vision, leadership, and commitment to the future of the arts. Uh, the Kennedy Center's self-expansion of the REACH was awarded to Stephen Hall Architects in 2012 following an international design competition, and Silman was a structural engineer of record for the expansion. The REACH provides much needed educational rehearsal uh, and event space, as well as a physical connection to the river and other presidential memorials. As you can see from an overlay of Lawn Punt's urban plan for Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center has an important and prominent location within D.C. Georgetown to the north, the Potomac River and Arlington National Cemetery to the west, and the National Mall and the White House to the south and east. The Kennedy Center is the nation's busiest performing arts center and a living memorial to JFK, the 35th president of the United States. The original iconic 1966 building was designed by Edward Terrell Stone and is located on the Potomac River in Washington, DC. Providing a direct connection to the river and nearby memorials was important to the center then and now, and Hall's design reflected this. As described by Stephen Hall in reference to the expansion, rather than an object added to the center, it's a landscape of terraces moving towards the river and cascading over the parkway to make the public waterfront connection to fulfill the original visions of the center. Beyond the pavilions, the balance of the structure, largely unseen as a visitor enters the site, is over 70,000 square feet of custom concrete slabs, slabs that span over, span over several large rehearsal spaces and long span parking lanes while supporting the three pavilions and the largest landscaped roof in Washington, D.C. Pushed down by the demands of sight lines, adjacencies, and the buildup to support landscape, and pushed up by the flood and excavation concerns, the structural slabs required all levels of creativity to achieve unparalleled shallowness, strength, and span. I'll begin by taking you through some time-lapse photos that help illustrate the site and challenges uh, and interior spaces of the reach. This view looks south from the terrace of the original building which will ultimately become the 70,000 square feet of educational and rehearsal space. We begin by demolishing a portion of the existing parking garage uh, in the center right of the screen. Subgrade activities begin. Uh, to the left, we can see cross site shoring and temporary support being installed for a retaining system uh, along the soil supported sections of Interstate 66. And now raft slabs and serpentine walls to the south and west of the site, which is uh, in the background and to the right, are being formed over and adjacent to DC uh, water infrastructure, uh, existing DC water infrastructure, and several freestanding concrete wall slab and uh, uh, wall mock-ups are visible to the left, uh, and the excavation continues on the parking ramp along I-66. Now the educational rehearsal spaces are starting to take shape to the west, uh, and that's off to the left, or the right, I'm sorry, and note the textures on some of the interior walls if your screen's large enough. Um, in the rectangular rooms. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little while. A major upgrade um, to the DC water infrastructure is beginning on the south end of the site. Um, this is part of the Clean Rivers program that DC water installed a 90 foot vertical shaft and diversion structure that will ultimately connect to the future Potomac River Tunnel. Um, elevated slabs are now being formed in the permanent ramp and lower walls for the retaining system at I-66 are nearing completion. And the pavilion walls above the main plaza are now being formed. Uh, elevated slabs are now being formed and the permanent ramp and retaining system for I-66 is nearing completion. 
And now the pavilion structures are largely complete, including the fluted vaults uh, that you can see in the, the foreground and uh, off to the, the background near the Teddy Roosevelt Bridge. And now glass facades and, facades and landscaping are being installed and the installation is complete and ready for visitors. So just taking you through a quick uh, snapshot um, of that timeline uh, and we can get into some of the more the details here. And, um, the structural system itself um, is reinforced concrete. There's over 20,000 cubic yards of concrete in the structure. Um, there's very little steel, as everyone on this conference will be happy to know that the steel was really limited to some pile foundations, uh, long span open web steel joists, and one column at the Welcome Pavilion, which is behind the, uh, the green tower crane. Um, and the pedestrian bridge itself was a steel structure. Uh, two main foundation types were utilized. This is a plan view of the, the north, uh, northern foundations. We used uh, pile supported grade beams and raft slabs and pile caps with slab on, slab on grade. Uh, the hatched regions to the west or left on the plan indicate raft slabs and unhatched areas utilize discrete beams and caps with slab on grade. There's a little bit of a shading off to the, the left hand side where a lot of the activity is going on in this plan. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Um, the hatch region off to the east or right on plan is a, is a buried combined sewer system that runs along the eastern portion of the Kennedy Center and the site to that DC water diversion structure. Um, this is the southern foundation system with a portion of the underground parking ramp to the east or upper right in plan and a bus parking to the west. You can also see the combined sewer passing beneath the structure and running parallel parallel to the South Foundation wall. This 1960s era combined sewer includes a large diversion structure near the center of the plan and several outlets um, to the south below Interstate 66. And then another uh, that turns west uh, to the Potomac River. Also shown here, built over the Potomac outlet is a recently completed DC water shaft, which I'll show in more detail in the subsequent slides. And it's this large L-shaped structure here that straddles this uh, existing sewer pipe um, in addition uh, to the southwest or bottom left in plan, is another area of raft slabs supporting a river pavilion spanning over the sewer structure once again. This is an early model view from the west showing the lowest level and how the new foundations relate to the existing combined sewer. Uh, diagrams like this were helpful in the early stages of the design to communicate the project's impact to this important existing infrastructure. And a similar diagram labeling the matter raft foundations beneath the occupied spaces, um, slab on grades at the bus parking garage and main parking entrance, and the retaining ramp to the northeast. These are some photographs of the new 90 foot deep vertical shaft by DC Water. And this was initially formed with a Seacamp pile system and eventually built over with landscaping that we see today. Uh, DC Water, the Kennedy Center, and the design team were able to advance this project years ahead of schedule to avoid future disruptions to the site. And several structural solutions were required at different areas to, to span over these existing structures, and we either spanned with uh, raft or beam, raft slabs or beams, or simply built over with slab on grade or landscaping. These are pretty, pretty massive dual height um, sewer structures. Uh, the parking entrance ramp along I-66 that we saw earlier also posed some significant challenges, including several smaller existing sewer pipes and constructing the ramp adjacent to uh, ground and pile supported sections of Interstate 66. This required close coordination with the Virginia DOT, who has jurisdiction over the Teddy Roosevelt Bridge and I-66 approach and the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration required minimal movement of the retaining system without the use of tiebacks below the roadway. So looking at this section, uh, Interstate 66 is up on my um, laser pointer now. Um, and uh, because we're retaining soil on the Kennedy Center side, which is left in this section, uh, the, the Highway Administration also required limited lateral movement in the other direction if the highway were, highway were to be completely removed and lowered in the future. This led to a U-shaped retaining system with batter piles away from the highway and a central deep shear key. And here's a photo of the ramps, uh, raft slab being formed uh, with temporary cross-lot shoring 
I-66 is above and adjacent to the white blindside waterproofing on the left-hand side of the photo. And this is the newly completed redeeming ramp with the lower phase one walls poured, allowing crosslot shoring to be removed and the secondary shoring to be installed near the bottom of the ramp prior to the elevated slab to be poured in that area. Uh, a horizontal cold joint and removal of crosslot shoring was preferred since the walls were left exposed and this avoided patched pockets in the walls uh, if the shoring were to remain in the full height wall pores. Uh, many different slab types uh, and thicknesses and support conditions were utilized. There was little uh, to no uniform orthogonal layout and very little repetition and all the slabs were, were unique in themselves. Um, flat, flat, slab, flat, slab, uh, flat height slabs sorry, range from eight inches to 14 inches thick and voided slabs range from eight to 27 inches thick achieving spans up to 70 feet. Several slabs utilized post-tensioning with and without voids, including the 65-foot span sawtooth-shaped slab over Studio K, a column-free rehearsal room capable of accommodating the entire National Symphony Orchestra. This is a floor plan of the northern slab areas. Um, the majority of the lower plaza and interior floor framing utilized void slabs, and the hatched regions on this plan are areas of void deck and the unhatched areas are solid concrete. There's also many interior uh, double height spaces at this level. Um, note that the regions within the void slabs that require solid concrete, these are really highlighted by areas uh, at columns, um, at the perimeters. Um, these are where areas of high shear require solid concrete. Uh, the voided slab systems are designed using similar theory to traditional slabs, accounting for the reduced stiffness and lower shear strength uh, of the void slab. And it's necessary to add solid portions over these column slab edges uh, for embedment anchors, embedded conduit, and of course for post tension, as we'll see in a moment. It does add a lot of coordination during construction, especially for the embedded elements, uh, and at least triples the number of concrete submittals that you'll see. Uh, southern slabs also utilize void slabs above the bus parking and entrance ramps while supporting heavy landscape loads and public plazas. Um, to the left is a 155-foot triple-span post-tension void slab, and to the right is a 70-foot single-span uh, with similar loading. So here's a triple-span with two intermediate beams and a 70-foot span, uh, single-span uh, over the ramp. Uh, to illustrate some of the slab types, the drawing on the left is a section through that 155-foot triple-span uh, over the parking structure capable of supporting landscape loads and the reflecting pool. Uh, the system combined the lightness provided by the voids and the increased strength and stiffness of post tensioning to limit the overall slab up to 24 inches. As mentioned, Studio K slab is a sawtooth shape uh, and aids in the acoustical properties of the rehearsal room. The drawing in the upper left is a section through the slab. Post tension cables were draped through each tooth to create the one-way slab. Mock-up was constructed to test formwork and the relationship between the sawtooth and exposed crinkle walls. And on the right, the formwork is being installed in prefabricated modular units. And here's another photo of the sawtooth slab just prior to the pour, post-tension bundles in blue and the conduits, uh, conduit runs in gray. The sawtooth profile is left exposed at the ceilings and held uh, short of the walls to create clean, clean lines along the wall. And here are a couple photos from uh, Studio K just prior to opening day. As I mentioned earlier, Kobiak's uh, voided slabs were used extensively throughout the reach, helping achieve the Kennedy Center and the Arctic's vision for long span column free spaces with relatively shallow structural depths, all the while supporting landscape and plaza loading. This requires additional considerations and close coordination between several, rave, uh, several trades. I'm not going to go through the detail of, of um, the analysis or design procedure, but uh, the big takeaway here is that it's an iterative process. Uh, you're making assumptions in the beginning, modifying your, your slab properties as you're going through the design, uh, getting updated, more clar you know, clarifications from the, uh, the project, and then going back and doing cyclical kind of loops of, of analysis and design procedures. You know, shear is, is one of the things that's, uh, you know, plays a large part that you obviously need to have that shear capacity in that solid section in, in certain regions, as I've mentioned several times. Um, so it's, it's kind of toggling back and forth between uh, 
efficiency of using the voids and not using the voids where we, where we need them for those strength properties. And certainly um, at the end of the design, uh, because these are voided slabs and we have our compression block on the top and tension at the bottom of the slab in most cases, uh, you want to ensure that you do have enough concrete section uh, in that compression zone above those voids uh, for positive bending um, and, and not lose sight of that. Uh, in addition to the more rigorous slab design, uh, voided slabs require careful coordination at every phase of the project. And um, you know, the, te the post-tension slabs uh, effectively become T-beams. Uh, in this case, we saw a couple of sections representing that, um, that we need that solid concrete for those post-tension areas to, to um, hold up to those forces. Um, embedded slab elements, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can pre-plan as much as you want, but at the end of the day, there's going to be some, uh, you know, some field adjustments, but pre-planning is very critical um, to identify all of these areas for everything, every type of embed. It could be even just, you know, post-tension slabs you need to have that coordinated pretty tightly anyway, but uh, even more so with these void slabs to make sure that you have enough concrete to be able to anchor to. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, this really translates to tripling the number of concrete submittals that you have. Um, you have a void slab plan shop drawing before, just showing the general layout of the slabs. Then you have that void slab being coordinated with electrical, plumbing, and whatever inserts uh, that need to remove uh, those voids in certain regions. And then you have to reanalyze your slab for that increased dead load. Um, and then after that, you might have you know, an as-built come in that shows where voids broke or shifted during the four. Uh, and you might need to reanalyze your slab again to see if those can be accommodated. And here's a, uh, an example of a void slab coordination shop drawing for one of the three um, triple spans over the bus parking. Uh, in addition to the voids, those electrical plumbing and inserts require uh, further void removals, increasing the overall system's weight. And just note that the longitudinal conduit runs in green here occupy those original void um, designated areas um, uh, so you need to make sure that they don't conflict with uh, the solid areas where you have PT drapes and things like that if you're using a post-tension system. So um, it's just this iterative process that requires constant coordination to make sure that uh, uh, the slab is going to be able to perform as intended. And the slab was, <laughs> the reach, sorry, the reach was also unique in that many of the interior walls and ceilings are exposed concrete, requiring nearly all electrical conduits to be embedded in the slabs. As you can see here, they become quite concentrated uh, and become voids themselves, essentially. So in addition to the planned coordination, someone provided frequent on-site coordination during installation to ensure the slab integrity is maintained. And again, just highlighting the fact that several trades are being asked to overlap in very tight areas, uh, including formwork, rebar, electrical, plumbing, PT, and voids. And everything needs to be in its place for the slabs that performed as designed, not only for strength, but also for the deflection uh, and in the case of the reach uh, for aesthetics as well. Now, once we get that strength uh, settled, we also have serviceability to worry about. So with so many long spans um, in the project and pushing the envelope of design, the long-term deflection was a big concern with the concrete, as well as coordinating areas where the facade may be supported on a slab. We had to confirm the sequencing of this with Gartner, the current wall subcontractor, and there's slotted holes for uh, 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 window heads and things like that. Uh, we produced an extensive deflection report for most slabs, indicating regions of concern, predicting not only the final deflections for each load type, but also an anticipated loading timeline. Uh, as we will see in a little, um, the elevated slabs were also required to support large formwork forces. In many cases, reshores had to remain in place longer than we'd like, prolonging the initial stages of creep. And another superimposed loading, such as landscaping, would not occur until after the facades were installed. So schedules were produced tracking the, the pre-planned timeline with the actual superimposed loading timeline. Those had to be closely monitored and the slabs re-evaluated to ensure that the facade and other deflection sensitive areas were not exceeding their limits. However, someone's involvement in the realization of these structures went well beyond the basic stress and strain and quickly included the design of the custom formwork, careful involvement in the development of 15 different concrete mixes specified for the project in consultation on core sequences, similar issues of constructability. 
This building is unique in that the structure is fully exposed, either as an exterior finish in the case of the pavilion walls, or an interior finish such as a board form and crinkle concrete interior walls. In the end, we have 15 different concrete mixes on the project ranging from 6,000 PSI to 12,000 PSI. Traditional mixes, self-consolidating concrete and shotcrete were all used. The signature of the exterior meant to be a contemporary reflection of the modernist Carrera marble clad EDS building at Redrill Stone is titanium white concrete. Uh, titanium white concrete, it was made from a combination of slag, white Portland cement, white sand, and titanium dioxide. Several concrete textures were also studied and two emerged as the primary surfaces for the concrete walls. Uh, the center photograph depicts the construction of a soda glass, a dug fur uh, board form wall. This texture appears on all eight exterior walls and interior and several interior surfaces. In flanking that photo, you'll see an architect's custom crinkle formwork in the performance spaces. And it not only provides a visual interest, but also an acoustical benefit that went well beyond initial expectations. The crinkle was originally a value engineering exercise to eliminate acoustical wood panels and ended up being one of the signature wall textures of, this, of these spaces. It's quite beautiful with the raking light in the Justice Forum. This is a, one of the small intimate auditoriums uh, in the project. Switching gears uh, a bit back to the mechanics, uh, someone also worked with the team to specify and perform a fluid pressure test. As some of the research has shown, the concrete may be able to achieve a gel state where pressure stabilized for tall wall pores. However, the test was inconclusive, and we ultimately recommend the Skylar Pavilion's signature south wall be made in three lifts to minimize former pressures and forces imposed on the structure. In fact, form work and form of pressure was a major challenge in how to form and pour the curved concrete walls at an elevated structure. The 42 foot wall tall skylight pavilion wall pictured here generates massive forces due to the pressure of the concrete wall pouring. The form work fabricator created an intricate system of form work including braces and stop end frames which absorbed the temporary head pressure and transferred them to the partially built structure. So sequencing up this adjacent structure uh, was critical in that making sure the correct shear walls were in place to resist the imposed lateral loads, reshores were kept in place to aid in transferring gravity loads of foundation. And here we can see some of the formwork uh, installed. On the left is formwork uh, at the skylight, south side of the skylight pavilion, so that, that big curved wall that we all recognize so well now. And on the right is formwork being installed on the west facade of the river pavilion. Uh, both, have, both are massive in scale in relationship to the final structure, as we'll see. Each of the pavilions celebrate concrete as a material and structure, exposing in all cases the interaction of highly articulated soaring walls and flying concrete slabs, all of which are exposed on both the exterior or interior, given the reach its unique external experience, appearance, and internal comfort. So I'll finish by briefly walking you around and through these spaces, both during and after construction. Uh, here we see one of the most iconic views of the Skylar Pavilion, the silhouette quickly replacing the original building as the center's logo. And the Skylar Pavilion's west facade is seen from below. And another perspective of the Skylight Pavilion, including an image from our analysis model that helps illustrate how the pavilion dances above the plaza and spaces below. In an interior view of the Skylight Pavilion during construction and after. Now the Welcome Pavilion features an expansive window uh, south-facing window flooding the space with light and drawing visitors into the center. Uh, here we see the superstructure being formed as well as a large swoop, swooping vault and a 90-foot post-tension beam at the top of the vault. And right here is post-tension beam and this is the vault being formed up in the plywood now. Um, and just another photo showing that incline beam being formed up before the vault uh, formwork is, is set in place. So a lot of, lot of formwork kind of flying off into, into space at these points. And here's a view of the interior of the Welcome Pavilion, uh, highlighting the expansive volume and swooping vault below the landscape roof. So off to the left in this photograph is that vault that we saw um, 
being formed up and having the landscaping on top of it. Uh, we also had a few areas of uh, particular unique structural challenges where we could insert uh, minor, minor structural interventions that would still achieve the architect's goals. The first was this, the PT beam at the Welcome Pavilion um, uh, help with the vault enabling, uh, the geometry of the vault enabling this to help support portions of that beam, uh, allowing for a deep beam action and compressive uh, tension strut to be formed effectively by cutting the PT span um, from 90 feet down to 50 feet. On the left is another view of the Welcome Pavilion from the upper plaza looking east with a long spanning post tension beam and vault to the right. And the image on the right features the north wall with a cast in place cantilevered stair. <laughs> and here's a collage of several different approaches to the Welcome Pavilion that a visitor may experience. And while the river pavilion's origins were in fact on the Potomac River, uh, we had gone through schematic design for a couple different um, schemes for a floating, a floating pavilion, even though it achieves its goal of extending the memorial to the river, riverfront uh, with its panoramic views, uh, and also provides a connection to the water that was so important in JFK's life. We designed this pavilion as a shell so the walls and roof act as a tube to cantilever off the elevator core to create a column free corner. And our analysis model helps explain this a little bit better and the, the, the plaza level slab was hidden for clarity. Um, the only interior support in this, uh, this structure is the elevator core. And we'll see here in a minute, uh, in a second, the elevator core in the background of this photograph um, showing that the roof the roof cantilevers to the east off of this elevator core, um, helping support a uh, deep beam that is the exterior wall uh, and also supports the, the mezzanine that hangs from that deep beam, um, all to create this, this northeast column free corner. Um, one of the most important design considerations is not only the reaches linked to the surrounding memorials, but also to the main building itself. A multi-span, 220-foot-long kinked post-tension T-beam ramp weaves through the rehearsal rooms along the Potomac. Vertical and lateral movement of the ramp were tightly controlled as glass facades were attached above and below. And several rendered uh, views were created to help communicate the varying and movement conditions at each support location. We're sort of using our ghosted view of this ramp uh, and then also indicating the uh, type of bearing uh, conditions bearing pads, just really utilizing some uh, PTFA sheets um, to create the, the movement required at some of these intermediate walls and then a uh, restrained condition at the end, at one end. Uh, and finally, a uh, covered walkway provides an exterior link between the performance halls of the Kennedy Center and the Reach. Uh, this is a 12,000 PSI void form slab and supported by alternating asymmetrical columns and features a 12 and a half foot cantilever to the north and a curved vault to the south. The cutoff in this photo is a little bit, but this is the end of the cantilever to this first pier. And we have this nice swooping vault um, that helps provide some support to the south of the, the canopy itself. So finally, the, the innovative design extended uh, past the intense boundary push in concrete design and beyond the footprint of the plaza. Uh, but most important to us, however, is that the reach has defined is its mission to serve all communities of Washington, D.C., extending well beyond the traditional Kennedy Center audience. Uh, for someone, this, coupled with the outcome of our effort, helps us reach closer to achieving our highest core values. Uh, the reach, in many ways, lives up to the premise that the best architect, the best structures are one that disappear into the architecture. And the creativity and the effort that goes into pulling that off, as the members of ACI know, is impossible to measure. So here's a list of the, of the different um, Team members that were involved in the concrete work uh, didn't list everyone, but here's kind of the, the major people uh, that played a part. And um, thank you for, for your time today. I appreciate it letting us present this to you. Excellent, Jeffrey. Um, so impressive. Thank you.